Hello, this is Brian Casey of The Imaging Wire. We are here at RSNA 2024, and we are here with Dr. Jonathan Chung. He is with uh, UC San Diego in California. Dr. Chung, thanks for being with us today. Real pleasure to be here. Thank you. So, Dr. Chung, you're a, a specialist in, uh, in chest imaging, uh, and you are the Divisional Chief of uh, Cardiothoracic Imaging at UCSD. And you've been following the, uh, the lung screening uh, market or, uh, area pretty closely, so that's what we're going to talk about here. Um, let's start, a, so lung screening is, it's been um, approved by CMS, you can get reimbursement for it, it's got kind of all the backing that seems to need, yet adoption of it has been really low. Why do you think that is? You know, just like anything, I think it's multifactorial, right? And so first off, I think that a lot of times the, the whole lung cancer screening, it's stigmatized, right? So patients who smoke, uh, those are the patients or who used to smoke are the patients who are eligible for lung cancer screening. And so um, there's a certain stigma with cigarette smoking nowadays, right? And that has somehow attached itself to lung cancer screening, which is, is really bad, right? It's, it's, un, it's really unfortunate that that's happened. That's, I think, led to the majority of the, the low adoption rate for lung cancer screening. The other thing is something that I think is really not insurmountable, it's actually pretty easy to figure out, would be the gap in education. So, most of patients who are going to be um, uh, appropriate for lung cancer screening, they're going to be first touched in the healthcare setting by primary care physicians or nurse practitioners or PAs. And so that is a wonderful opportunity to introduce the idea of lung cancer screening, whether the patient wants it or not. But again, so if you remember, think about the last time you went to your primary care doctor. So when you were sitting there, you probably had like five or six things you wanted to talk about, right? And so obviously the, the primary care physician or MP or PA, they want to address those questions that you have, those issues that you have before they get to that screening side. And so, so there's so much that they have to do. But again, that's a big educational gap, which I think can be addressed. Yeah. So um, let's talk a little bit about what organizations can do to increase enrollment in CT screening um, or in, in lung screening. And one of the things that I've been noticing in, in presentations this year has been the importance of nurse practitioners, which you just mentioned. Um, what are some other steps that organizations can do to increase lung screening enrollment? Yeah, I think that the radiologists, we have to get out of the reading room. right? We have to interact with our clinicians, especially people who maybe not are up to up to speed in terms of the latest literature. So I think a lot of times physicians, they go to a lot of these CME conferences, they go to meetings and whatnot, and so they may know that lung cancer screening is essential to pursue anyone who is appropriate for lung cancer screening CT. But maybe people who are, who are nurse practitioners or PAs, maybe they don't have that same level of education or same access to that education. And so locally, it would be wonderful if we as radiologists could get, get out there and actually teach people during their, their grand rounds or during uh, big meetings where everyone's coming together and reminding people that we should be pursuing this aggressively, lung cancer screening CTs, and why. So yeah. you can tell people what you should do, but if you don't tell them why they're doing it, the motivation is not there. Right. Now, w with lung cancer detection, what is it that makes it so difficult to, to detect, both on, on CT and X-ray? Yeah, so I, I remember coming out of fellowship, I thought, oh, lung nodules, lung cancer, it's pretty easy to detect on CT and X-ray. It's not that easy. It's, it's much harder, right? It's a, sort of that sophomoric thing. Um, more and more CTs I see, the more and more I realize how hard it is to detect these pulmonary nodules and early lung cancers. And so, Doing it by yourself, I think, is a recipe for disaster. You need a backup. You need something like an uh, AI tool that is, uh, has a computer-aided diagnosis uh, standpoint to it, but then also something else that sort of augments your visual assessment of the images. For example, Clear Read CT is wonderful because it has a computer-aided diagnosis component to it, but it also has the vessel subtraction. So you're looking at for these nodules and these early lung cancers in more than one way. You're, you're allowing the, the, the CAD to do it, and then you're also using your eyes. And then and when you say vessel subtraction, what exactly is going on there? Yeah, so through this complex algorithm, I'm not an engineer. I don't know how they do it. It's like, it's almost like magic. So um, 
the reason why nodules are so hard to see on a CT scan is because you have the vessels in there. You have the pulmonary veins, you have the pulmonary arteries, and so these will obscure small nodules on CT scans. But if you could take out all the vessels, so all the arteries and all the veins, now you're just left with nodules on a sea of black. And so if you can't see that, right, you probably should reconsider a different field other than radiology, right? You know, probably medical students could see that, right? Um, and so that's, so you, you've made that a, a higher contrast study. Yeah. It's like looking for a needle in a haystack, but you take away all the hay. Exactly. It's exactly what it is. And so um, if you told me 20 years ago that someone could create an algorithm that could do that, could take out all the vessels, I would have said crazy, impossible. Because yeah. the vessels branch at not the, in the same way in different patients. Yeah. So how could you design something that does that reliably, patient after patient after patient? Yeah. And, and do tools like this make reporting faster? In addition to like finding the nodules, does it make your reporting faster? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. So. Obviously, computer-aided diagnosis is helpful in terms of increasing your efficiency, but the vessel subtraction is very, very helpful because any radiologist is not going to just rely on a computer-aided diagnosis algorithm. They're going to want to look at the actual CT itself. And so the vessel subtraction, again, you've taken out all the vessels, so it's much easier to see this nodule on a sea of black as opposed to when it's superimposed on different pulmonary arteries and pulmonary veins. So, yeah, I, I would say like any, nowadays, any tool out there, any AI tool, if it's not making you more accurate and more efficient, it's a non-starter. Let's, let's talk a little bit about x-ray because right now CT, at least in the US, is the only indicated technology for um, uh, lung screening, but there's, there's so many chest x-rays being done and, and chest x-ray does play a role in, in you know, lung cancer detection. So what do you see the role of x-ray being in, in lung cancer? Yeah, so it, as a formal screening tool, you're not going to use x-ray, right? So there's data to su suggest that it's just not quite good enough. But in the setting of a population, right, so the, you know, what's the most commonly ordered imaging study in the world? It's, it's chest x-rays, chest radiographs, right? We get so many of them. To not leverage that data to look for pulmonary nodules or early lung cancer is would be really, really unfortunate. We have a nice opportunity there to detect these cancers even before they go to CT. But the problem is that the average radiologist, even good chest radiologists, sometimes it's hard to see these early lung cancers and pulmonary nodules. So how do you address that? Again, we need a little bit of help, right? And a little bit of help are these AI algorithms, things that could take the, the bones out. So either dual energy or, or bone suppression. So Riverine has a bone suppr suppression tool. You take the bones out, it's much easier to see the nodules and lung cancer within that chest x-ray. So this is kind of similar to that, uh, that vessel suppression that we talked about for CT. Exactly. Great. So, well, Dr. Chung, um, one of the things, uh, you know, lung, CT lung screening, it's been frustrating because it has been approved for so long, but it seems like it's really, it really is starting to get a lot of traction right now. Where do you see it going in 2025? Well, hopefully the adoption rate will increase. Right now, at least locally in Chicago and San Diego, the adoption rate for lung cancer screening for appropriate patients is somewhere in the 5% rate, some, sometimes a little bit higher, sometimes a little lower. Um, I, I heard recently that there's some data suggests that number's going up, and that's wonderful. That's welcome. I'm, it's, it's, it's a huge win for, for the lung cancer screening community. But still, we have so much more work to do. A lot of patients who are eligible for lung cancer screening are not getting their CT scans, and really got to make that push. Good. Well, let's hope that happens. Dr. Jonathan Chung, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. Signing off from RSNA 2024, my name is Brian Casey.